I've learned this the hard way. Whenever I get angry or about to make a decision that I'm not really comfortable with, I ask myself this first. I, I try to. I'm not. I'm human and I'm not perfect, but I I try usually. I say, Kevin, if you had the opportunity to go back in time and redo what you're about to do, what would you decide to do? What would you have done differently? And then the answer comes, and I instead of waiting till then, I do it in the moment instead. And usually that answer is, don't get angry. Don't act out. Think. It calm. It calms me down, and it really, really, really works. It's magic. It truly. Try it. If you think I'm joking about it, it's magic. It really works. It's powerful. It really is powerful. And you know, we're talking about going、uh, time travel. You kind of laughed when I mentioned that. And who's to say it? That's in itself not a form of time travel. And welcome to another installment of Behind Greatness by Inspire. It's、uh, Luciano here as your host speaking.、Um, before we get into our next conversation here with Kevin, I want to remind the listener:、um, if you are a new listener, thank you and welcome.、Um, please share,、uh, subscribe,、uh, and when I say share, share with your family and friends. Share with the people you、uh, you care about most.、Uh, with whom you share information and experience. That's、uh, the best. That's the best kind of share. Um, and then I guess the third ask、uh, for the new listener uh, and uh, recurring one,、uh, recurring ones know、uh, what this ask is about.、Uh, we're a, we're a not for profit and we're a charity. We do not profit from uh, uh, this initiative、uh, at all. We all、uh, we all run our own thing, and this is something we've been doing since 2011.、Um, so we're able. We're able always to move forward, and not just with the energy that we have internally here, but with、uh, any donations that、uh, anybody wishes, any listener wishes to give. You can、uh, you can then find how on our website. So behindgreatness.org,、uh, we issue tax receipts, obviously as a charity,、uh, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that. So thank you,、uh, thank you once again,、um, and thanks to the regular listener. Uh, you've been on a journey. We hope、uh, that's as exciting as we think it is, and we haven't stopped. We're not going to. And every single week that we record a conversation, we're、um, that much more excited because it's more stuff we learn.、Uh, and today is not going to be any different in experience. So we are joined by Kevin Day、uh, at his place in southwestern Oregon. Correct. United States, obviously, for non-US listeners.、Um, Kevin,、uh, Kevin has had a, a very interesting life. So Kevin was,、um, amongst the many things, when he worked for、uh, US Navy operations, an anti-air warfare coordinator.、Uh, he spent many, many years as a、uh, as an operations specialist, senior chief petty officer for the US Navy. Uh, he he was on many duty assignments and on many operations, including Operation Praying Mantis, Operation Iraqi Freedom, Operation Desert Storm. He holds a master in education, uh, uh, a bachelor's of business administration, and also an instructional instructional design for e-learning certificate.、Uh, he's got a couple of published works,、um, two very distinct published works that we're going to talk about here. Uh, sailors,、uh, excuse me. One、uh, called Sailors Anthology, which is、uh, which can be found in the Library of Congress,、uh, and、uh, the Bald Eagle Amateur Geological Interpretation, which is something we're also going to talk about.、Uh, Kevin has had some、uh, incredible experiences,、um, both、uh, actually all of them overwhelming for anybody who listens in.、Um, We ask the listener here before we get started:、uh, have an open mind,、uh, a very open mind.、Uh, we ask for people to be skeptical,、uh, but at the same time open-minded,、uh, like Roger Nelson taught us、uh, to be. So,、uh, without further ado,、uh, we want to welcome Kevin. Kevin, thanks for coming on. Luciano, I、um, the honor is mine. Thank you very much. I, uh, it was a scramble getting here. I just had come off the golf course, and you I wanted to roll a couple hours early. And my wife 
scrambled and she was able to pick me up as I was walking home. And so I might smell a little bad, but you can't no, we smell can't. me. So we're good. <laughs> <laughs> we won't be able to tell. Thank goodness. <laughs> no, 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 you guys, you guys have been awesome. Uh, both of you, uh, both you and your wife. Um, and we had a very cool conversation uh, and a very heartfelt one. I, I've been, I've been learning uh, that you are, you are a man who doesn't, uh, who doesn't hide what he is, which is, uh, which is wonderful, refreshing too, uh, especially uh, somebody with your kind of background. So let's, let's, let's get into it. Um, <laughs> you, you said a lot of things that uh, to me, when we last spoke that were sounded pretty ominous. Uh, but also uh, some things that were equally as uh, empowering and enriching. Before we get a glimpse of uh, any of that, let's uh, let's start uh, a little bit further back so that the, the listener knows uh, your background, your operational background. Let's let's say that uh, you you were on separate, uh, you were on different missions uh, around the world, more or less, uh, working for the U.S. Uh, U.S. Navy, starting in the '80s. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. Okay. I joined in 86 and uh, my first ship was USS Vincennes out of San Diego. Why, why'd you join the Navy? I didn't ask you this before. Uh, to see the world. You to know, I, world? I, I, I yeah, it. I um, graduated high school and I um, wanted to go travel. So I became an international exchange student and I got to go to Australia. <laughs> and that really whet my appetite, Luciano. And uh, so I, you know, I came home and I went to junior college, graduated and I, I was like bored, you know. And then I started working at a golf course because I love, love golf down in Sacramento where my parents were. And I could have stayed there, of course. And then I spent some time in Jackson Hole, Wyoming as a ski bum working at night, cleaning a, a local grade school or um, junior high school. And I was just a ski bum. That's pretty much what I was. And I, man, I got to do something. So I ended up joining the Navy. And boy, howdy, am I glad I did. What an adventure. You shared something with me like r almost right off the top when we first when we first connected, uh, a harrowing experience and a, a tragic one. Uh, is that something you'd be yeah. willing to um, talk about? And, in and, and I got to tell you, Luciano, yeah. mm, if I get emotional a couple of times, I'll be you, man. Mm, it's real, man. But you know what? I was able to turn that tragedy we're going to talk about a little bit into something pretty beautiful. And it was, it turned out to be my salvation. You know, it was my first deployment. I was on the USS Vincennes and I did really well in the operations specialist school. And I, I actually graduated on a graduate, the number one graduate out of 90 kids um, because I wanted to have a choice in where I went. And that was the first uh, Aegis spy ship on the West coast. And radar was our game, so I, you know, I chose it. And on the first deployment, and I was up on watch. My normal watch station was uh, a position called Jots. And all it really was is a computer glamorized at the time, a navigation system. It just happened to be right by the captain, right behind the captain up in Combat Information Center, where I normally stood watch. And the date came around, it was July 3rd, 1988. And the next day was July 4th, so... um. We had gotten, you know, be, you know, be ready, basically, because we don't know. And sure enough, um, our ship was, we got a little bit kind of close to the international uh, boundary. And um, the Iranian ball cameras came out and a, a gun battle ensued. And they started shooting at us. We returned fire. They fired at our helicopter, which we were luckily able to um, embark back on board the ship as we were maneuvering and turning. And right then, a uh, um, aircraft launched out of Bondar, I bet, a boss, Iran. And I had been watching that piece of sky for, what, two months? And deep down inside me, I thought, I was thinking to myself, Kevin, that's a commercial airliner. But you know what? I was standing watch with all the decision makers in front of me. The captain was up there. We were at general quarters. Right in front of me, as close as I am to you right now. And I, so I kept my mouth shut. I wasn't on comms, you know, I, but I was overhearing stuff. But deep down inside, I was, I was screaming. I was holding myself back. Everything I could. And then the captain stands up. He says, make goddamn sure they need a commercial airliner. 
And then I relaxed. I shouldn't have. Because we fired, you stood up, turned the key. Two missiles brought down Iranian Air Flight 655, killing all 290 people on board. It crushed me. My best friend in junior college was Iranian. He could have been on that flight based on his family and stuff. Anyway, I, I damn near got out, Luciano. I, was, I didn't know what to do. I blamed myself. And then I heard that um, there was a probably an F-14 behind it. And it turns out if I had said something, I may have gotten us all killed. Think about that, because the USS Stark got blown up kind of the same way um, a few months before. And I thank God I didn't say nothing, because um, a few days later, they signed an international peace a, a, a peace agreement and stopped the war. Just think if I would have said something. Thank God yeah. had me in that spot. This guy that keep my freaking mouth shut. You know how hard that was. I, I, I did. I, I knew I, what it was. I, I didn't have no evidence, no proof, no authority to speak, no training in air defense, none of it, none of it. Zero. I was a boot camp operations specialist. Hey, how old were you? Oh shit! Go ahead. How old were you? I joined a little bit late in the Navy. I was uh, at the time. Um, just turned 26. Still yeah. very, very young. I know. And I almost got out, and, and I said to myself, you know what, Kevin? Don't get out, buddy. Stay in. And make goddamn sure it doesn't happen again. And that's what I did. And so what I did is I, I, I was sleeping, and I woke up in the middle of the night. And this poem I'm about to show you. And I'll send it to you. Woke me up. And I made a couple typos. And I corrected the typos. And I was a message writer. I wrote, I wrote this poem. I took it up to the captain of the ship. Our captain Rogers in command. And he got up the next morning and he read it on the general announcing system in tears. He was sure he was going off the ship in handcuffs. For the listener, sorry, for the listener, Kevin, did. we're we're gonna put we're gonna put that poem in the show notes in the bow so everybody can read what you wrote. Yeah. Beautiful words. Well, I give you a fair warning. I'm able to control my emotions, but you know what? I have to use them too. Because there's so many charlatans out here in this. I wasn't prepared for UAP. And it was a real eye-opener because there's so many charlatans out here. And I really have to be careful who I even talk to, what I say. And so for me to show my true self is all I need. Do, do I look like I'm lying? Well, for real. Uh, we're speaking to you because we know you're not. Nope. Um, and the stuff I'm about to tell you ain't lies either. Well, like, so, you were, like you were like you were saying earlier, some the, the journey that I've been on is unbelievable. Let, let's set the stage then. Uh, I, I mean, I didn't uh, for for respect. I didn't ask you to to give me the story because I kind of knew about it. That's why we wanted to reach out to you to learn more. Um, but you had stayed in the Navy. You 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 had the resolve. You stayed in the Navy for another 15, 16, 17 years. Something is that right? Or I'm doing my, that's my math. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Until until something else that happened that you just alluded to a couple of minutes ago. Yeah. So I ended up doing uh, six ships total, um, three admirals tours and three Aegis cruisers. Ended up going to um, air intercept control school, and then I became an air and control supervisor. And we're the guys on board the warship. Um, we tend to be so. Uh, focus with the uh, anti-air defense commander, usually an Aegis or uh, DDG um, Aegis ship, spy ship. 
So and you we're are, the, we're the sorry, is, is it a you is it a carrier? No, 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 no. It's a small, it's a small boy, not a carrier. Okay. okay. Carriers, the big aircraft carriers, of course. Right. And we're, we're the missile shooters, basically, that go with them. Okay. To protect everyone. And one of our jobs as an operations specialist is to control the aircraft that launch off the aircraft carrier and take them to the fight and then get them home safe after the fight. That's our job. So you're and overlooking that. Yeah, to do it safely so they don't run into something they're not supposed to or end up shooting something down they're not supposed to and on and on and on and on. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I ended you know, I was pretty good at it and I got selected and I went to top gun school. And one thing led to another. Um, I, and because of all that, I, I was able to get qualified as anti-air warfare coordinator, which is actually the, the um, top position on the uh, air side, on the air defense side at uh, Combat Information Center. And my main role in that job was to take all the sources of information and create a picture in my head and then provide a tactical rectimation to the front table decision makers. I mean, they could follow it or not. It was up to them at that point. You know, I, I gave them my best recommendation based on all the watchstanders that are helping us out, you know. And it's, it is a pretty important job, you know, because um, basically we're the ones that chuck missiles. I'm not the actual uh, missile system sub. He was my left-hand person. And I used to say man, but that's not fair anymore because there's, you know, wait, wait, during the event in 88, there was only men on board, but that's not the case anymore. And I have to say this, by the way, Luciano, sure. the best damn leaders I ever worked for were women. Dude, I And people that. of color. Yep. And that's the God's honest truth. Anyway, that's I became an anti-air warfare coordinator. And um, so anyway, I'm um you've heard about my first deployment. Mm -hmm. And strangely enough. I was on my very last underway in uniform. We we're off the coast of San Diego. And by now I was a I was a top trainer in the strike group. My job then was to take notes and create a um a training after action training report and lessons learned and provide it back and make some fine-tuning details to the because they're getting ready to go on deployment. And when the when the Princeton got back in port, I was gonna transfer off the ship, go work for the Admiral. And I was up in Combat Information Center and I looked up and what in the fill in the blank with a bad word is that? I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I really couldn't. All those years behind that radar, we had these objects coming from um, lower Earth orbit. <laughs> and I'll just give you a number because this is the unclassified number. Okay, eighty thousand feet. And they were they would come in. We would. Um, I, I was gaining an awareness of them in my role because we have ballistic missile watch defenders. That's not that was not my role. I'm a tactical guy. OK, like usually lower down in altitude. All right. But anyway, I became aware of them at about 80,000 feet and they stayed in groups real tight, five to ten at a time. And then all of a sudden, bam, <laughs> literally quicker than I could snap. They dropped down to between 20 and 28,000 feet right off the coast of Catalina Island. I just kind of stayed there hovering around. And then one by one, which was really weird. We, If you can, I know you're kind of reversed. So we're off here off the coast and they're coming down off Catalina. And what, and here's our training area. One by one at a hundred, at a hundred knots, 28,000 feet, right by our ship. Going around, and every one of them disappeared off Guadalupe Island, off the coast of Mexico. in exactly the same Latin long. You said right by your ship. What does that mean in terms of uh, distance? Well, they they passed our ship in the sky, okay. and we were we were tracking and reporting. We put them on the data links, and I was scrambling everything I had to. I, uh, my personal perspective, there was some sort of test going on, and they just forgot to tell us. Yeah. But I have to tell you, man, I wasn't I was in no way concerned. These things were hostile. In fact, I had quite the opposite feeling. There was an overwhelming feeling of benevolence. I couldn't believe it. I, I I thought they were there to see the wells. After a couple of days of watching these, I knew, man, these this is there was something weird going on here. A couple and I, of I days. Go ahead. Sir, you were watching for a couple of days. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. If I could just tell you now, um, I first picked them up on the, about the tenth of November, and we tracked them all the way through about the sixteenth, seventeenth, 
groups of five to 10 each. And if I added all the groups up together, it's about a hundred objects all together. A hundred of these things. Yeah. Assuming and every one of them groups. disappeared. Off. Yeah. In different groups yeah. and each group had between five and 10 objects in it. Yeah. Uh, Radar it, detectable object. And, and so did you and see visually them with... detectable? You could watch them. You can see them oh, okay. through the binoculars. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. That's what I want to ask. Did yeah, you saw them with your naked eye and yeah. on the radar? Because I was, I would get, yeah, I would get the position on the radar. I'd run up to the bridge and look at them, and run back down and get another look up. I mean, I was do. I got a lot of exercise over that ten days. <laughs> and you got your <laughs> steps in. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 and this yeah. is in, this is in two thousand and four. Correct. Yeah. November 2004. Okay. Yep. Okay. And, and, and you were, did you have uh, any of your colleagues see the same? Oh yeah. The, every ship in the strike group was tracking these things. Every ship. Yep. And um, every ship. And um, you got to remember that Princeton is the air defense commander, right? So everyone's looking at us, which means may, Hey, Sailor chief, what are these things? So I'm scrambling to find out an answer for everyone, but uh, I didn't know. So we did the best we could. We tracked them and reported them on the data link, sent it back to the beach. You know, we, we were providing the data if someone wanted to see it. And it, believe me, it goes to the beach. There's places that receive it. Trust me on that one. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I wasn't really concerned. During the night on the 14th, the uh, air wing flew on board the carrier. We're getting ready to do our, our training. We're going to do a big, huge air defense exercise. It was all planned out. And I was the guy that designed it and planned it and briefed it in the whole nine yards, right? And that's when Kevin Day became concerned because I didn't want to crash into one of these things, right? It was right in my training area. So Captain Smith comes down to combat. I said, hey, sir, you know, we've been, we've talked about this and we've been tracking these objects for several days. And I very strongly recommend that we intercept one and find out what the hell these are. Because if we don't and I crash into one, Somebody's going to ask both you and I, sir, why we were so damn incurious. Hmm. And I kind of shut up a little bit, let it sink in. He looks at me and he says, you're right. So your chief intercept VID, visually identify. The whole air side went, woo. <laughs> ah. I wanted to, yeah. It was like okay. a big relief. Yeah, it was, hell yeah. So, so Fast, Eagle, Fast Eagle launches, uh, Commander Fravor, this is the kind of pilot he was. Mm -hmm. Um, top gun trained gung ho dude got my salute right takes off we take control take him to the closest object gets in the visual arena uh, his number was twenty thousand. I, I seem to remember 28 for, but we'll go with his number twenty thousand because you know he was right there with him i was sure. a lot was going on put it that way and it was a long time ago so he entered as soon as he gets to the inner we call it merge plot merge plot on a two-dimensional radar i'm seeing two objects now they look like one now, but you know, they got, we use symbology. I, I never look at radar, raw radar. We assign track numbers like four, four, two, six, four, four, um, three, eight, whatever the number is. Right. Mm -hmm. So those two numbers and symbols merge. And right when that happened, this object, whatever the hell it was dropped out of 28 or 20,000 feet straight down to 50 feet above the water in 0.78 seconds. No sonic booms, no nothing. So he leaves the wingman up high, he goes chasing it down to the surface, and he, he gets down um, and merges with it again, down low. And all of a sudden, we're listening to the, the intercept comms on the on the speaker in combat information center, and all of a sudden, we hear it. You got to remember, this is one of the mo most badass pilots the Navy's ever produced. Braver. And he gets on the radio and says, oh, my God, oh, my God, I'm engaged, I'm engaged. He was shitting his pants. And I don't blame him because this thing did unbelievable maneuvers around him. And these are his words. And right in front of him, bam, disappeared. Right in front of the aircraft. And you know where it went? You're not going to believe this. In a strike group air defense, we have pre-assigned positions in space. Like if, if this is a notional threat and this is us over here, we've got points in the sky. And we put aircraft on them and we're ready to defend in case they come at us, right? And before we even launch, we know who's going where. Everything's mm -hmm. pre-assigned. And guess what happened? This object that Fast Eagle 01 intercepted went to Fast Eagle 01's assigned cap position. 
combat air patrol station. And there was eight of them. Not close, not close. Exactly on the latitude, longitude, and the assigned altitude. It was like they knew. It definitely knew. That was the point. And for many years, I was, I was, and I didn't figure this out till SoCal. But you know what that was, Luciano? It was a message. That's what it was. It was a message to be understood by someone later. And oddly enough, that someone just happened to be me. Because I understood it. Because long, everything went on. And let me jump to the end here. And we, we can go back and because I'm on the point now. Um, when this all thing whole, this thing all broke open, uh, Gary Voorhees and I, we, we both heard it break on CNN. And so I call him and say, hey, Gary, we got to do something. We can't let Commander Fravor hang in the wind by this because we were there, man. And I can prove it. I got a, a book in the Library of Congress that I published in 2009. There's evidence that really happened. Five I got years later. Out. Five years later, you posted something or you, yeah, you I, entered I, into I, the library. I, I got to speak out. You know, so we ended up mm -hmm. forming a company, nonprofit like you got called UAP Expeditions. Uh, Caroline Corey funded the whole thing. God bless her. We went down to SoCal. We had um, University of New York quantum physicists with us, uh, David Mason, one of the leading technologists in the world. So we had a, a crack team there. On We rented a beach house in Huntington Beach, had all this gear on top of the table, uh, everything from magnetrometers to gamma ray detectors to um, you name it, it was on this table with detecting, right? We didn't know if we were going to see anything. We took a gamble, or Caroline did. She had a lot of money riding on this. And the movie at Terror in the Sky resulted, just so you know. And sure enough, they yeah. showed up. Yeah. Not they only did up. they show up, Luciano, they showed up through a wormhole. And so what does this mean? Here's what happened. We, we'd set up watch, and all of a sudden we had, we had a team on, um, on Catalina Island. We had a team in Huntington Beach, and then we had a mobile unit. So we had triangulation going on in case we saw something. And sure enough, um, David Altman, he was on the team. He was over on the island. And he's, he calls over and says, we got something. He was pooping his pants, right? So we all run up to the roof. And sure enough, <laughs> we had these radar detectable objects in the sky right above Catalina Island, right where the Tic Tacs were. And they were in a hole in the sky, if you can believe that. Hole in and the sky. So you saw recorded, an opening. David, yeah, and this was all recorded because uh, our quantum physicists had written a paper about it. And if you watch the film, it's on YouTube now. It's free. It's called "A Terror in the Sky." You'll see, you'll see the the video of it. Okay. Yeah. And, um, so the the message from O four was, um, the they're aware, right? How else did they know I was going to be on the roof? When I say I, I mean us. Unless they were aware of it ahead of time. That's what they were doing in 04. They were leaving a message that, yes, we're here and we're aware. And a lot's, and, and I personally believe I figured out why they're here. I, I think I know why they're here. I've had some independent confirmation of it. And it's going to sound weird. I warn you. But we're open to the weird and wonderful, like Mary Rodwell. Don't worry. Go. Okay. And it, this kind of led to my interest in geology, which we'll talk about. Mm -hmm. But Luciano and listeners, they are here for our rocks and our souls. Explain. Now that, now that sounds bad. When I say souls, they ain't here to kill us. Nope. And it took me a while to figure this out. And then when I first heard that, I was kind of, whoa, what are you talking about? Right? It kind of set me off a little bit. And then I really understood what they were talking about. Because let's just assume for a second that the universe is really is full of life. And ET really does exist. And they're really, really super smart. Right? Like we also, well, like some of us suspect. And I'm thinking to myself, um, we're humanity 1.0. And they're, they're humanity 10.0. And they are here to scout humans who are ready to move up to humanity 
Is this what you mean by taking taking our souls? Is that is that what you mean? No, after after we pass. Nope. After oh, we pass. Okay, so after is, we pass a natural life. Yep. Okay, so let's talk. Take. Let's talk These about those two things. They're benevolent, man. If they wanted us dead, it would have happened a millennia ago. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. I want to I, I want to parse it out because I I want to I want to get into what uh, you've been feeling. Now you got to remember, this is all this is Kevin's. Um, I don't even know what, idea. Sure. I, I'm speculating. Okay, please know that, and I know I am. Well, you you've been stewing you've been better, stewing on this for about <laughs> you've been stewing this for about 19 years. So you have a right. you have a leg up on us on thinking about it at the very least. So <laughs> make me make me understand when you say then. Because uh, you you've said this after death, so they we come here for rocks and souls. Let's let's talk about the souls. W w uh, elaborate, please. Make me understand your thoughts, your opinion. Well, humans, um, the human spirituality and personality and behavior and all that stuff runs a pretty wide spectrum. I think you would agree with that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. everywhere from zero to which call it evil if you want to um, really um, people who are into volunteerism and community service and would give you the clothes off their back and everything in between. If, if you were a, um, a super intelligent being, who would you want to move up to humanity to a, the evil person or the person who might be ready? Yeah, I That's guess if you were about. recruiting... And it depends on what your purposes are for recruiting. Well, let me ask, let me ask you this. Um, it all goes back to this fundamental question. Um, do you believe this is it? I mean, after we pass? That's really what it comes down to. If your answer is yes, then what I'm saying is bullshit for you. Sure. Uh, the, but if it, your answer is no, I think it goes on, then maybe my ideas have some merit. Right? Part of the discussions we have here in this podcast is about exploring what happens afterwards with people who think about it and study it right. and maybe measure it too, uh, to some extent. So th this is why I'm asking you, I, uh, um, what, what led you or what has been leading you to the, to the conclusion uh, or to the hypothesis, whatever, I, I, sorry, wh whatever we want to call it, to the thought. I have trouble. I have trouble. I have I struggle with describing it myself. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that's why I forget. That's why I step back um, to the idea that they are recruiting those uh, who have uh, can I say cleaner uh, uh, or more pure intentions. Why? Why do you think, I think this? That's a good, because that's what they have. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. They okay. Want to, you know they're yeah. It's like if you're going to join the military, right? They have a certain standard they're looking for. Or your brother and sister, they're not going to let you join. Probably, right? Like if you have an um, extensive drug history or criminal record or on and on and on, you're probably not going to get to join. Same thing applies. We, we've but had... Yeah, it, please, please remember, yeah. Luciano, this is yeah. just my ideas. Uh, not written anywhere, and I may be full of BS. No, huh, I, that's okay. I accept that. We're 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 open to it. I mean, you had yeah. uh, you had have had experiences that most human beings haven't. So we want it. We want to understand. Um, okay. Uh, so we've had we've had people on the podcast who have seen other beings, like non-human entities. Uh, but Reverend Carter, Michael Carter, uh, Lynn Buchanan, remote viewer. Uh, and, and they've they've described actually in detail on this podcast what they've seen, who they've seen. Have you seen any beings that are non-human, or at least that don't look like us now? Not to my knowledge. Okay, okay. So then let's go back to your feeling, because you said just to go back to ten minutes ago, uh, you said that when they were flying overhead and people were seeing that people, your like your other officers and uh, other uh, combatants. Uh, we're seeing these things. You were feeling the benevolence. Did you feel a rush of emotion or was it a general cushy thing that uh, you existed in or was it something different? Well, if I could put it like this, my, my job at the time was to assess hostilities and mm -hmm. intentions. And that's what, kind of what I'm saying. I, I didn't sense any type of hostility. And these things were as peaceful as a commercial airliner would be. That's what that's what I mean. 
Yeah. I mean, is a commercial airliner out to hurt you? Probably not, right? I mean, it has happened, obviously, but probably not. So yeah, that's kind of more what I mean. I'm, I'm not talking about magic or um, gods and spirits, that kind of stuff. It was just a, it was a friendly. In fact, um, you know, I really thought Luciano, because yeah. November's well season, the, the gray wells, they kind of congregate Catalina and they make the transit down to guess where? San Miguel Island off the Mexico, that same transit these UIP things were making exactly. So in my mind, I was thinking they're here to see the whales. And that was kind of confirmed when um, all of a sudden uh, Fastigal comes over. Uh, Charlie, which was our call sign on Princeton, we may have a downed aircraft here because he was. He's, they saw a disturbance in the water. And we were thinking, oh, shit. So we started immediately um, scrambling to do search and rescue. And because as soon as you hear that, you start executing certain things. You go get people out of the water, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. But then he came right back and said, oh, no, scrub that. We think it might be blah, blah, blah. You know, it was sea, sea life of some kind. Did they uh, hit the water or go, uh, did they uh, submerge themselves as well? Very, very good question. And it, 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 my, and the answer for me personally was not my situational awareness that they went right. into the water. But I have heard that, in fact, they did. But you have to remember my role. I, I wasn't a subsurface person. I was focused up in the sky. Yeah. And so when they got, you know what I mean? Yep. Once command, once they intercept, once I, we kind of stay off the radio. Once the intercept happens, we let the, the pilot do their job, right? Right. And kind of, we say, we radio silence, let them, until they switch back to us. There's actually procedures that we use, right? Yeah. So no, I, didn't you, any, I didn't have any awareness that went into the water. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yeah, and you did explain that detail uh, before what yeah. your scope of work was. Uh, and yeah. wait, last question on this, on the the feeling of benevolence, is that a sense that uh, every 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 crew member had as well, or most of your crew members? For the rest, I'm beginning to hear um, more and more that others did. Yes, like did did did, did the crew talk about it? I guess they. Do, um, what am I? Not not too much. Yeah. Okay. This is where the story kind of gets. The most interesting part of this story is what happened after Tic Tac, believe it or not. Okay. So before we get there, because I forgot to ask you to describe what you saw, because you said Tic Tac and, you know, I know what Tic Tacs are, but maybe the listener doesn't know. Is yeah, that, that's so, what they look like? Well, all I, I remember all I saw, I saw radar, because um, I actually went to Rob Radar a couple of times. Mm -hmm. We ran system diagnostics to make sure they were real and all that stuff. And I was looking at symbology, but... The only thing I saw is when I ran up and looked at these things in both daytime and nighttime through the um, big eye binoculars, and I saw a big magnified pair of binoculars up on the ship's bridge. Yep. And I'd find the closest object, get the uh, relative bearing, relative range, and find it in the sky. And all I ever saw was a, a white light. That's all I ever saw. Nothing fancy, right? Mm -hmm. But um, according to Fast Eagle, Commander Fravor, when we did a, a, a meeting after we all got back to the beach, I went up to him and said, hey, sir, what did it look like? And he said, Senior Chief, um, the best I can describe it is um, a giant white Tic Tac candy. And that's where that word came from. Is the first time I heard it was when he, out of his mouth. Tic Tac candy, he said, there was there was no doors, no windows, no flight surfaces, no um, obvious means of propulsion. It was just a big white candy mint. Yeah, so... <laughs> I, I, we'd re we'd recommend then to the listener who hasn't heard of this yet just go youtube tic tac david fravor and you'll see you'll see exactly yeah. what that footage was so that's video footage that you were privy to because you, you were on the ship measuring and seeing the stuff yeah okay so then um I, uh, talk to us about then w what happened afterwards because you said the story uh, also gets very interesting after yeah you know what when this happened my and I got to make this emphatic. My only concern was safety of flight. And so at the post ex meeting and all that, I raised my hand. They were like, Senior, what's up? I was like, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we got a safety of flight issue here off the SoCal. And they're like, what are you talking about? But you know what happened when I tried to describe what had happened? I got laughed at. All anyone heard was UFO. Hmm. I'm being serious. I can show you cartoons right now. They were running all the newspapers in the strat group with their jokes and people looking down their nose. What the hell you've been smoking, right? I got, and I, so the ship pulls in, I transfer and they got me off the ship. 
um, pretty damn quickly, I have to add. To this day, I don't know why, but I was due to transfer anyway, but it was ex expedited, put it that way. So I went to work for the Admiral over on the island, on Coronado Island, and uh, Commander Naval Air Pack, my last command. Same thing happened. I tried to speak out, got laughed at again. Um, I was an E-8 uh, senior chief, and I was eligible to make master chief E-9. And for whatever reason, that year was right at the end of the drawdown. They only made one master chief in the whole navy mm -hmm. and looking back on it they they chose the right guy you, you know I, I knew him i didn't ever serve with him but he was a hell of a yeah they made the right choice and i congratulated him you know it hurt at first but you know so anyway i i, I got out and i uh, went to school or excuse me um it, before that i i uh, went to defense contracting i was doing training analysis or basically the same job only i was a civilian doing it now and once again, I tried to raise my hand. Hey, we got a safety issue. And guess what happened again, Luciano? I got laughed at again. Even worse this time. My direct boss, and I'd known him for, what, 15, 16 years? He looks at me and says, Kevin, what in the frick have you been smoking? You know how bad that hurt? <clears throat> so I said, hell with this. No one's going to believe me. So. I went home. I quit. I said, no, no, what I'm going to do. I'm going to write, because I like to write. I, I'm going to write a short story, and I call it The Seer. And I'm going to take the, I'm going to take the Tic Tac um, encounter, and I'm going to fictionalize the whole damn thing. I'm going to change all the names, and maybe even change the date. And But I'm going to keep the word Tic Tac, I'm going to keep all the ships, and I'm going to describe it to a T, what actually happened. And I'm going to hide it within a bunch of other short stories. I'm going to publish it in the Library of Congress for two reasons. One, it made me feel a hell of a lot better doing something positive. And two, just, in case, the story, just in case the story ever became public, that my book would be there to prove it. Because there's no way to go back in time, is there? <laughs> well, I don't know. Uh, you're you're ah, telling good us. <laughs> <laughs> that was a trick question, by the yeah, way. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course, I got on that. I, and when yeah, did you so anyway, when, yeah, the, when did the, you write that? I wrote it in uh, 2008. Published it okay. in February 2009. I have the Library of Con Congress control number if you want it. Yeah, it's actually, I have it, I have it here. Uh, two zero zero. I have, to add, right now. I have to add right now. Yeah. Um, the reason why I wrote it was two reasons. I just described the other one. And and the reason why I published it on Amazon wasn't to sell it, was so I could get more copies if I ever needed them. <laughs> nice. So you got them. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, here's the truth. And um, since 2009, you know how many copies I've never promoted it. You know how many copies have been sold? Tell me. Two. 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 So you have the two copies there in your in your den. Well, maybe there's three now because I ordered. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it less than it. definitely less than ten. And a simple reason I've never promoted it. It's not why I wrote it, and mm -hmm. I've never I've never accepted money for this work. I absolutely refuse to. I've had offers, believe me, but for me, it goes against the honor system. Why? It, it why violates you... my code of honor to to turn this into to try to monetize this? Yeah. No yeah, way. It's... I'd rather shoot myself in the foot, man. Literally, you 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 spend a lot of your time right now volunteering in a community. So that's yeah. also what I learned about you. This is who what who I want to be. I, I had the question because I'm just uh, I'm perplexed of why you were laughed at there before your retirement. If UFO. those same people witnessed the same thing you did, UFO. Yeah, but they witnessed the same thing you did. They were afraid to speak out. So they laughed instead of supporting. Well, the, the people who actually witnessed it with me never left. Oh, they just but didn't support. Others did, yeah, that weren't there, that were hearing it for the first time. But Lucy, I got to tell you this. Yeah. You know why I'm not mad at them? Tell me. Because if the shoe had been reversed and the shoe had been on someone else's foot, I would have been the one laughing, maybe. That's honest right? of you. That's honest. No, it's, it's the truth. 
So how in the hell can I sit here and have the luxury now to say I would have been different when it ain't true? I may have been doing the loudest laughing. Oh, that, I'm sure that's yeah, kept so you I, do, I don't have any um, ill will and quite the opposite. I have all the respect and love for them. It, 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 that that is the probably one of the toughest things I've found. Uh, not even just doing this podcast and talking to people. Um, it's reserving judgment. That's like the toughest thing, because it it's so easy to give judgment and to meet it. It's just so easy and natural for us. It's tougher not to. And uh, no, I, I I appreciate your honesty when you say something like that. Well, I, I cheat. Oh, way to, yeah. <laughs> you know how I do it? Go tell me. And I've learned this. I've learned this the hard way. Mm -hmm. Um, whenever I get angry or about to make a decision that I'm not really comfortable with, I ask myself this first. I, I try to. I'm not I'm human and I'm not perfect, but I, I try usually. I say, Kevin, if you had the opportunity to go back in time and, and redo what you're about to do, what would you decide to do? What would you have done differently? And then the answer comes, and I, instead of waiting until then, I do it in the moment instead. And usually that answer is, don't get angry. Don't act out. Think. It, calm, it calms me down, and it really, really, really works. It's magic. It truly try it. If you think I'm joking about it, it's magic. It really works. It's powerful. It really is powerful. And you were talking about going uh, time travel. You kind of laughed when I mentioned that. And who's to say it? That's in itself not a form of time travel. Ha! Ah. Oh, well said. Well, well said. Because, well, here's the thing: because the wings of the butterfly, right? Mm -hmm. that's why prediction never works there's an equation for it um at least we think um and they've proven it with the double split experiment with electrons you, there's an ex, there's an equation that tells us you can't predict in advance the position of electron around its nuclei right mm -hmm. the only time you can tell the position of electron is when you actually observe it that's the only time so Predicting kind of goes the same way. There's too many wings on the butterfly. You might get close, but, you know, the butterfly is going to go where it wants, kind of going to follow the wind, but not really. But what you can do is remote view. You're a remote viewer as well? Um, there's people who believe I can, yeah, which is a shock to me, believe me. What, uh, yeah, do you believe been, you can? There, well, there's been some recent things that have happened. I even hesitate to tell everyone. Um, it's up to you, kind sure. of, It's kind of smoking gun evidence. I have the ability, yeah. Yep. So uh, without training, because we've had a bunch of remote viewers as well here it, as guests. It, it trained me. It trained you? Okay. Well, come on. Now you got to tell me. Okay. Um, my wife and I were avid cloud watchers because we got we live in a beautiful place and we got birds. She feeds birds and... We're constantly going in the house, sweetheart, you got to come see the cloud. You got to come see the bird. So we're used to dropping everything we do and then go out there and see what the other one's talking about, right? So it was on my birthday. I was out in the yard working, having fun. I look up in the sky and there's this weird looking cloud. What the is that? It looked like a dragon. Oh, yeah, yeah. You showed me this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Over to the southeast, right? So I, I went in I it, something in my head said, Kevin, get a picture quick. It wasn't loud, but it was like an overwhelming feeling like I get. And tr trust me, I usually follow my instincts. I ran into the house. Kim, quick, grab your camera. You got to get a picture of this. She comes racing out. And I said, hurry up. Let me stand right below it. And she gets a couple of pictures. And I post them on the internet kind of naively, right? And people immediately come back. And I don't know if maybe you even were one of them. I said, Kevin, do you realize you were standing underneath a dragon head cloud? But you know what happened? You know what happened? I, I, this is weird because earlier in the summer, I had noticed the insects 
we did we had an insect swarm here for some reason we literally had we have a bunch of five two to five hundred year old oak trees here on the property right they're beautiful we had like literally these little tiny black spiders coming out of the oak trees i mean there was webs they were glistening in the sun and the house was full of them mm -hmm. ants were really aggressive flies were really aggressive and um it was really really hot and everything was dry and i just had this overwhelming feeling that there was going to be a big fire and this was before the big fire so i took that dragon head photo and i emailed um a couple of my close cohorts, uh, Dr. Jack Sarafati and Dr. Bruce Solheim, because mm -hmm. um, I'm pretty close to both of them. And I said, um, this is what happened. There's going to be a big fire up to the northeast and or a big earthquake. Or I'm sorry, up to the north northwest, because this happened in the south um, east. And I, what I did is I drew a line right where this, I drew a line right through where I saw the cloud through the top of my house and it went northwest. And it just felt right. So I said, it's going to happen. There's going to be a big fire up to the northwest of me and or a big earthquake. And four days later, the fires broke out. Biggest fire in our state's history. They just put it out. Um, I spent two, um, what, five weeks, um, probably lost 15 pounds. Um, wow. uh, dragging out all the brambles on the whole property. Nine acres all together. I, I only did four because the other five is pretty good to go, right? And I don't technically own it anyway. It's in the family. And uh, I knew there was something coming. Now all the neighbors going by, like, what in the hell is Kevin doing? And now everyone's doing it, right? And then this this kind of goes into the geology. Something weird happened that's kind of related. Anyway, about four days later, we had a major geological event. And it's still happening. We just had a four six off the coast, northwest what's, of us. What's four six? Earthquake. Oh, we've had a oh, whole bunch. Yeah. Of, we've, we've we've had a whole bunch of them. And Luciano, um, you've heard of Cascadia earthquake? No. Three hundred years ago, there was a huge earthquake here, and it kind of terraformed the whole west coast. Hmm. Three hundred years ago, and they suspect the one before that was three hundred years before that. And what's happening is that the Pacific is spreading. Are they're putting pressure? towards the east and it's moving the whole Juan de Fuca plate and the Josephine Ophiolite. And every 300 years, it results in a massive earthquake. So um, 300 plus 300 equals six. Um, three divided 900 is 300 again. So we're overdue by about 30 years for a big, huge earthquake. When? I don't know. I'm in... In fact, um, the very first thing Dr. Safardi said, Kevin, don't make predictions. It doesn't work. Yeah. And he told me why. And I said, hey, relax. I already know. You've shown <laughs> me the math. I agree. Yeah, yeah. He does but show at the, the math. same time, trust yeah. me, I know this is going to happen, but I'm not saying when. So you, know, you, not so you mentioned that they're they're communicating or you're being communicated to because you also mentioned Jack Sarfati in the last conversation. He came up yeah. in a conversation we had with Frank Milburn, who was also. Uh, I, I can't talk about any of this without mentioning him because he's he's helped me out quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, and that's what I've come to learn as well. And yeah. you you said that he's he's told you that you're a contactee of Tic Tac Intelligence. Direct quote. Yeah. In fact, he said um, he was emphatic about it. So, and Jack Sarfati is a theoretical physicist. I mean, yeah, uh, he is, yeah, he's okay. theoretical quantum physicist. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's, work, yeah. he's working on warp. You no, know, he's working on warp drive. Yeah, we want him on the podcast as well to talk about this. Um, fascinating, just it's, fascinating. Well, it's, not, it's not impossible. Well, <laughs> right, that's why it's this is fascinating because I we want to talk to people uh, on this planet who who explain things differently than others. Bingo! Now <laughs> you're on the right track. Yeah, my the recommendations are what's exciting is stick with the academics on this. Well, yeah. uh, so not just and, and, and I got to warn you, man. Yeah, the academics. It's not a. It's not like a wedding cake type of world they live in, man. These guys um, get in some pretty heated discussions. Okay, let sure. me just tell you that. And you've seen it on the emails. Yeah, you right? and I are both kind of entangled with, uh, with, yeah. those, uh, you know, with those emails. They get pretty, yeah, no uh, punches. 
help. But <laughs> not just academics, though, because uh, in my yeah. opinion, because yep. you also said something. This is before uh, uh, before I met you. Uh, you said something on a, an interview that uh, piqued my interest, and then you repeated it in kind of different words when we spoke last. And the thing that you said to me was, when people experience uh, objects like this or have this kind of experience with uh, pot potentially a non-human intelligence, there is something that changes in that person, that there is a, an artistic flow that starts to open. Hmm. Boy, howdy. We, we like to talk to uh, uh, artists, uh, artists by vocation on this podcast as well, because there's a different perspective that they bring. What, do, what did you mean? What do you mean by that? And I'm paraphrasing you, by the way. Those are, those are my words. Well, probably. first of all, I don't think it's magic. Okay. I think there's actually a change that happens in our brains. And it's located in our um, basal ganglia, okay. which is in, it's, uh, inside, it's on the top of our spinal column inside of uh, another part of a brain called the tamalus. tamalus. And it's, there's four lobes in our brain, right? And the basal ganglia is basically our internet, if you will. It's the communicator with all your nerves in your body mm -hmm. and all your muscle system. It's the thing that communicates, right? So what I think happens with some people, apparently, not that everyone doesn't have the ability, but with some people, um, apparently what's happening is the basal ganglia is getting upgraded. And that kind of, for me personally, that explains why, like me personally, um, I'm having problems with short-term memory. Because if you think about it like this, um, a car has the battery, right? If you think of a brain in terms of a battery. If you put more than one car radio on it, it's going to create more of a drain on that one battery. Just simple, simple, right? Sure. Electrical circuit. Now imagine putting an entire house in that battery. So if if a part of your brain's getting upgraded, it's gonna, it's gonna have to borrow resources from the rest of your brain. Um, so what I think is happening for me is I'm my basal ganglia is getting upgraded, and I'm gonna talk about that in just a minute. At the expense of some of my other functions, for me it's short term memory. I suck at it. My wife helps me out a lot. And it's probably just temporary. And I'm also having petite mall seizure. And I think that's related to it as well. Huh. I can't drive anymore because it scares the shit out of me. The thought of crashing into someone just, I walk everywhere I go that I can. Thank God I live close to town, you know? Yeah, that makes sense why you told me to I be drive my wife crazy because I'm, I'm the world's worst backseat driver. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, I'm just not comfortable in a car. I don't know it, why. How how have your how has your creativity been upgraded? Like what what is it that you've done differently? How, oh how my changed? god! Um, that, for me, it's manifested into a self-diagnosed ADHD. I am so creative; it's off the hook. I can suddenly um, sing. Sing? You've yeah, never sung before. Draw. Like like Picasso. Like break. I could break out your portrait in maybe fifteen minutes. And I just know how to do it for some reason. Um, um, inventions. I'm inventing stuff. I'll give you one example. Um, when the fires came, everyone was asking Kevin Day, what are we supposed to do? What? what? So there's ready, set, go, right? And we were all packed and ready um, to go in case they told us to get the hell out of here because a big fire is coming. But it was so much confusion and chaos. No one knew where to go and what to do or nothing. I got so disturbed, I, I walked down to the city hall and I said, um, everyone's asking me what the plan is. And I got told point blank, call the fire department. We don't do that. And I was like, um, OK, so I called the fire department and they were closed because they're all fighting the fire. So I, I got pissed off. You know, if I can't figure it out, how, what the hell is the public supposed to do? So anyway, I made a stink, and they were had a big meeting down here at the high school. I could hit a golf ball to it. So I went, and it turns out that the BLM Forest Service was there. And it turns out they knew what the hell was going on. Like you would not believe, they're very, very professional. Can't say enough for the job they did. Thank God. If, if not for them, this place probably would have burnt down. But 
I saw the disconnect right there. I could see it live. So I was over, I was taking pictures and the, the BLM lady came over. She was a volunteer coordinator. She said, um, introduced herself. And, um, and I forgot, I'll remember her name in a minute. Anyway, she said, well, what'd you think? I said, well, I, I got a question for you. Um, there's a, obviously a disconnect here between the public knowing what to do and you guys having a great plan. What are your ideas to get the word out? She says, well, we're kind of struggling with the same thing. And I said, well, I have some ideas for you. If you really want to listen. She said, well, I am. That's why I came over here. I said, we need to rethink our existing infrastructure. And I asked her, um, what's the first thing we save in the big fire? She said, homes. I said, uh, and the second thing, um, what powers homes? The, the power grid. I said, bingo. So what we do is along, along the power lines, everywhere you see a power line, we string um, colored LED lights all the way down the power lines. Different colors, ready, set, go colors, because they're um, green, yellow, red, right? And we get to go, you're driving home from work, and all of a sudden the power line's red. Guess what? Then you're going to go home and look on the internet. Then you're going to alert your neighbors. Then you're going to call your mom and dad and say, hey, we got to go. The power lines are red. I said, same thing on the stoplight. What about, what about put that third light on the stoplight? It, it, ready, set, go. And not only that, but say which direction you got to go. It's pretty cool. Pretty cool idea. And her eye, her eyes got about this big around. The other day, I was um, walking down the golf course, and guess what I saw him doing on the power lines? Nah, come on. <laughs> I don't know if they were putting up LED lights, but they were sure cutting down brush and stuff around them, and looking like they were putting some effort into it. <laughs> you isn't you... it a no-brainer? You can get twenty miles of LED lights for what a buck fifty. They're just I... they're like power strip, you know. They're, you yeah, see yeah, them. I've seen them. And they're bright as hell. You're going to see them in the daytime. And not only that, the power pole right here from my house is 3, 3, 11 a.m. I'm sleeping. I'm not on my phone. I'm not going to check the internet. The fe- I mean, they have an alert system. I'll go send to your cell phone. But at 3, 11, I'm not going to check my cell phone, am I? But goddamn, if there's a, right here, my transformers, there's a loudspeaker. You in the whole neighborhood can hear it. This is the fire marshal. We're at ready, set, go. Now we're at red, go. And I also gave him this idea. Yeah. And all and all the in all the, the buildings in town, in public buildings, stores, and everything, there's a system called Empower. And that's just one of them. You can edit that out if you want. Okay. But there's systems out there. The central administrator can have full control and there you can set it up. Okay, this is this part's for the the place of business or the city, the city's public announcements. This part is for the place of business, and this part is for ready, set, go. And so, what can happen is the sheriff or the fire marshal can get right on and right in the everyone shopping, do 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 do, do watching the display, right or in the restaurant eating, and all of a sudden the fire marshal gets on the TV. This is Fire Marshal Jones. There's a big fire on the corner. Of blah blah blah. Please stay clear of the area. Isn't that brilliant? Hmm. Makes sense. That see that the answer is it's not one thing. It's a combination, just like in the Navy, man. It, you have to do a combination of things because people are on different time schedules and they're you you know, you, you know what our, our primary to this moment, our primary yeah. system for emergency alert in the United States is what? AM radio. Who the hell listens to AM that? radio anymore? Who? Can name one person. I listen to JPR, but it's on FM. <laughs> you you told me your mission. So just to just to shift a bit, but not really. Um, you probably lost some listeners there when I said JPR, no, but <laughs> no, no, no. no. Uh, you said uh, your mission is to help save people from ontological shock. Yes, because it might not end well. Yes. Uh, my personal suspicion is. The reason why NH, um, NHI has not contacted us yet. Non-human intelligence history, by NHI. Mm-hmm. I think they have in our remote ancestries. But the, I think the reason why they've left us alone, if you will, is because 
they are concerned it's going to end badly for this planet. Think of all, and I'm not going to bash religion. My own parents are very religious, mm -hmm. and God bless them, you know. And I love God myself, but I'm not smart enough to pick a religion, okay? But what's going to happen to all those folks? It's going to blow their minds, isn't it? You would it, think it would, um, but I mean, I, I, I know, and there have been people on the podcast who are uh, ardent Catholics, as an example, who do, who, who do believe that there is an HI and they're readying themselves, so to speak. Amen. And that, and it's happening more and more. Yeah. And maybe that's why they're starting to show themselves more. Because yeah, what you do, well, yeah. that is starting to happen. They're finally. starting to show themselves. Yeah, very good. Because the, the, the people that are ago, showing themselves, we're, sure. we're having them on the program. Yeah. I, I can't even believe what's happened in the last five years. Yeah. Five years ago, if I'd have been standing in the store and someone had started talking about UFOs, everyone in the store would have looked at them like they were nuts. Now it's common conversation. <laughs> Well, it's wonderful. It no, just means that, twice a year. that people are open. Like, you know, maybe, yeah. maybe there is hope. All in the maybe. last few years. You Isn't that beautiful? You, right? Well, you, you said, you, you also told me that there, there are, you believe that there are benevolent beings, but also malevolent beings. Well, um, this goes back to my theory of um, why they are here. And it goes back to the yeah. rocks. Rocks. Yeah. Thing. I wanted to get you into rocks. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. Um, again, I'm going to speculate. Yeah, but it comes down to 50 50. Throw a coin and see where it hands heads or tails. And we all kind of agree to the notion of the Big Bang. I'm okay. sure there's some folks out there who don't, but let's go with it. Okay, Big Bang. <clears throat> Was the Big Bang intentional or unintentional? Good question, dude. I say it's 50 50. So I have an open mind. If, if it's 49 51, someone tell me, please. Give me some evidence, right? So right now I'm going with 50-50. Okay, well, that means a lot. In the 50% case where it was intentional, wow, just what might an intended universe look like? Hmm. And more importantly, what happened to the intender after the Big Bang? Yeah. Who and did what the tender, is the intender? Yeah. Did the intender... Um, choose to survive the Big Bang or choose to commit a, com a cosmic suicide? Again, I'm going to speculate. Again, it's 50-50 because I don't know. Well, who but created the, case, the who created the intender in order to have a Big Bang? Well, let me, let me finish. <laughs> um, in the case that the intender chose to survive, in what form? You know, there's four known fundamental forces in nature right you got gravity you got strong and force nuclear and you got electromagnetism right so if the intender chose to survive all of that would you choose to be a fundamental force or a non-fundamental force wow so i personally think that yes yes and yes Intention itself is a fifth fundamental force in nature. Number five. And I personally believe that it's a it's physics, just like like we can engineer stuff off physics and electromagnetism. We use it every day. I think it's objects and engineering can be done with intention itself. And I think that's what these UAP air objects are made from. They're made from the physics of intention. With the other with the other fundamental forces helping out. Not only is intention a fundamental force, it's the grandmother of all the other ones. In fact, it might be the the only one. I've had that suggested to me too by certain others. I was corrected on that. Said, nope, Kevin, it, intention is the only fundamental force. And I'm not sure what they meant by that yet, but I keep saying them, but there's a reason. Fundamental physics of intention. Well, so then let's talk about the rocks uh, briefly. Uh, explain. Okay. What, what so, your thoughts are there? Yep. And so here's my thought, right? Um, um, the Big Bang happened 
and somehow life got here, right? We're, and you tell me how it happened, but it came about. And we know that um, our DNA in our bodies um, is, is the lattice structure is made out of phosphates. And if 50% phosphate and 50% sugars, and you got some acids um, mixed in, you can make DNA, RNA, right? RNA is the thing that allows DNA to be modified and, mm -hmm. and allows you to grow and all that kind of stuff, right? And heal and all that kind of stuff. What I think they're doing is, and they've been doing this for a long, 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 long time. And you have to agree, our planet in the solar system, at least, and probably in the universe, is pretty darn rare. We have a salty sea, and we have um, an inner core that's warm and hot, and we have thermal, hydrothermal vents in our oceans. And so what, in the hydrothermal vents are the, the world's original mineral sorters. And the, the quality of the phosphates that come out of these hydrothermal vents is so high that that's the reason why UAP are coming here. They are going down to our oceans to get phosphate rocks, believe it or not, to take to suitable host planets in the solar system and maybe the universe that are in Goldilocks zones around their host sun and just leaving them there. In the hopes that in maybe a billion years, a photon, a single photon, will hit that phosphate rock just right. And the way I like to describe it is a life spawning photon seeding the um, lifeless, lifeless quantum wombs of rocks. It what it does it on a quantum level, the photon interacts inside the phosphate, and it. It sparks off DNA, creates DNA. Why would they want to populate other uh, potential planets and uh, outside it, the galaxy? It's their prime motive. And some of these beings are so bent around the axle, if I can use that, they're not going to take any grief about it. And I call them non benevolence non And they're not hostile. Yeah, they're not hostile. They, if they wanted us dead, we'd been dead a millennia ago. But uh, the way I understand it, even if my own brother was trying to kill me, I'm going to defend myself. All right? I'm not going to be real benevolent at that point. I'm going to defend. And that's what we're seeing with these things. We shoot missiles at them, they're going to defend. So we got two groups of these things, and I think they've been kind of battling amongst themselves. They've reached a kind of a trade agreement, if you will. They got two branches of them. One are very kind and loving. They're benevolent. That was a 2004 variety. Tic Tac guys. Mm -hmm. um, whatever the guys and gals, whatever the heck they are. And you got the other group that's a little bit more aggressive. That's what I'm talking about. Have you have you ever sensed that you were uh, you were watched? Oh, never. Never. Nope. Is, uh, I've have never you, seen one. Yep. Uh, have you sensed that, that they exist? I've never, seen the, I've never seen that. I've never seen an alien, though. No. No, no. Have you ever that sensed word. that they exist? Because you, you've oh, said no, never. Nope. Because you, the reason I ask is because you've seen, you've seen these UAPs, UFOs, and you've sensed the benevolence. Have you sensed it the other? No, I haven't. Okay. Gonna, I'm only my re, my own research has led me to those beliefs. Put it that way. Okay. Okay. Got yep. your outside research. And I'm All speculating. Right. Please understand that. Yeah, yeah, of course. You I have to in this, don't you have to in this? Because you know, everything I've said, Luciano, is um someone please tell me a better explanation. I'm all ears, man. Dude, there's a common thread here. We're we're just trying yeah. to get at it. That's why we're asking I'm all these ears. questions. Please, I'm I'll accept it. If someone wants to prove to me that the tic tacs, no, Kevin, unfortunately, they were a test and NASA was doing and cool. Oh, well, so, but you did you know, mention Brian, I, tell I, me. <laughs> Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. you I, I forgot to ask you at the beginning of this uh, th that there were like men in black or uh, unidentified uh, military folks who, who came onto your ship and took material yes. away after the 2004? Yes. Um, I wasn't aware when it actually happened because I had gone down to get some sleep. Yeah. But I, I went back up to uh, Combat Inf CIC Combat Information Center. I was going to do an after action report. In order to do that, I, I was going to have to go on the um, computer systems and get all the data so I could write a real technical report. You know, I, that's, you have to, right? 
Mm. So I, I went to do that and the, the computer technician comes up to me, sets me down, says, I'm um, serious, chief, I got something I got to tell you. So what? He said, the data that you need is no longer on the ship. I said, what? What are you talking about? You know, that's not supposed to happen, man. USS Vincennes will tell you that. Right? It's illegal as hell. You can't do that. So I said, what the heck? He said, not only that, sir, they came on, you heard us go to flight quarters. Well, that was then. They came on board the ship. They took everything out of the computer central. And not only that, this was um, Gary Voorhees, this uh, then boss who was telling me this. I won't say the name. Mm -hmm. It's one thing I never do, by the way. He said, you're not going to believe this, but they also had us erase all the blank tapes. Wow. Yep. And... And so my suspicion is the data still is it still exists. There's no doubt in my mind. So how do you... fact, I heard uh, what three weeks ago that our data our data that was going back to the beach um, it was definitely being watched by NASA. Yep, NASA was aware of this. Yep. So how and did the, was, how did the video the of the all the agencies were they were they knew this was going on. They knew. I'm not sure if it's some of them probably during and some of them near time and some afterwards, but uh, how did the uh, video of the I just tracks... recently heard and I, it's not confirmed, but yeah. I just heard it and my source is pretty credible. So right now I'm going with it. I, I wanted to ask you, I uh, wanted to make sure I get in this question. How did, how did the, how did the video of the Tic Tacs then make it uh, into the public sphere? Was that also taken from the ship at that time? Like uh, the famous Tic Tac video that we all know. Wow. Yeah. The one where the object goes off to the yeah. left left side of the screen. That, that was a Tic Tac. That was a Tic Tac encounter. Yeah. Um it was either uh uh Fravor's flight crew or the one subsequent to it. And I, I was never really clear on that. Yeah. Anyway, suffice it to say, um a couple of days later I was on my a uh, Cypernet. It was a secret email version, right? We use it in the Navy. Mm -hmm. And there, that, that exact same input video was in my email. That's when I first saw it. Huh. And so I, I kind of played it for others when I went to Com Commander Naval Air Pack to kind of give some sort of evidence. We got a safety of flight, and it still didn't work. And so I already told you the whole story, the post, what happened yeah. to me and everything, at least the military side. If I haven't told you anything about what happened in the wilderness out here. We might have to do that on another show. Yeah, we might have to do that second part. Yeah, or maybe I, we could talk for four days about this stuff. Just know. <laughs> I know. Yeah, so help me. I've lost my train of thought. What we're talking no, about. No, the, the, uh, the video, the actual video evidence. Oh, okay, and... yeah. So a uh, long story short, um, I ended up volunteering down here at the local golf course. Um, I love golf. Do, 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 do. I had just reopened the kitchen. Years had gone by. I forgot all about this, right? And had had a completely adopted a new life and I was carrying out a plate of food and Bob, you're oh my fucking God. No. I dropped the plate. On CNN, we're watching the golf tournament. All of a sudden that video was playing. Mm -hmm. The video that was in your email, the secret email many yeah. years prior. It, it shocked me really bad. Cause, and you know why? Because I knew in that moment that my life was going to change. You know why? Because I knew where evidence was that it really happened. Mm -hmm. I, had a hidden, I had hidden it in the Library of Congress. And you weren't wrong. Yeah. I'm not wronged anymore. You wouldn't believe the type of people watching me. In fact, um, I won't tell you about the wilderness part. I'll just cut to the quick. Um, I, I roll back out of the wilderness, um, and that part's incredible. Um, NASA itself is onto my geological discovery, just so you know. Um, I roll back, and I was over at a friend's house, and I ran into these two guys. And they said, hey, Kevin, we saw your geology research online, and we're local marijuana growers. And um, we we supply the dispensaries and stuff, but we, we're rock hounds. We want you to take you out to the wilderness. I said, hell yeah, I'll take you out there. I was excited to show them, right? But I was also kind of suspicious for some reason. But anyway, I, I went along. 
I said, heck, man, if they want to kill me, I'm dead already anyway. So it was just them and my dog, Red, um, rest in peace. We're up on the top of the mountain, and um, black, there's a lot of black bear back there. It's amazing I even survived, right? Um, it was a pretty eventful year when I was back there looking for gold, right? Anyway, Red goes taking off after this black bear, and I turn over the forest, it was forest in Shakate, and I said, quick, fire around. A dude, quicker than I could freaking blink, bam, right by my ear. And, of course, Red Dog was trained to break off and come straight back, which he did, right? And that dude, Forrest, had that, had that thing secured back in his holster quicker than lightning. The marijuana grower. It was, it was that moment that mm -hmm. I knew they were spec or because there's no way. There's no one on planet can fire that quick unless they've been specially trained to do it. So that's when I knew. Anyway, we rolled back, and I didn't say nothing, right? But I knew. And we get back to my my first house that I had here, which is another unbelievable story how that happened. But anyway, they sat me down. I said, um, Kevin, we have something to tell you. I said, what? And uh, Shakate was talking. He got emotional. He was near tears. He said, Kevin, you are incredibly important to what's about to happen. I looked at them like they were friggin' nuts. I had no idea what the hell they were talking about was like what what my golf sucked that bad <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah it, and then uh Forrest pipes up and says we don't want you to make a continental plate slip into the ocean i was like what and uh okay um this is weird mm -hmm. yeah bizarre right and that's when i knew and then strange things started happening. I started seeing weird people. And I've been being watched for a long time, put it that way. But you know what? It's not a bad thing. I thank God they're watching me. Because they're probably looking out for me, too. I have not. I have never been told not to speak. Um, in fact, just the opposite, if you will. Um, I've been in, um, in more ways than one encouraged. Not 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 specifically and directly, but um, enough to know what I'm supposed to do. Yeah, not discouraged. And what role I'm supposed to play in this. And I'm signed up for it, man. Use me. I've made that clear. Well, you're, I mean, you're communicating this I've made now. that very clear to them. Use me. Damn it. Use who, me. Who, uh, who, are those, who are those two guys who, uh, who they are opposed to being John? Um, Lou Elizondo. Through the ATIP program. Of course, I didn't know that at the time, but yeah. took Lou in this house, my new house, when Lou Elizondo and uh, Tom DeLong came to interview me, I said, because uh, I was real suspicious. Why? I said, oh, getting ready to leave. I said, oh, Lou, I got a question for you. He said, what's that, Kev? I said, did you happen to know those two gentlemen? Uh, I think Forrest and Shakate were their names that came to see me in 2011, 2012. You know what he said? He looked at me, kind of a wink in his eye. He said, I emailed them. Huh. Huh. <laughs> I, I knew better than ask anything else. I just shut up and oh, I got it. I yeah. understand. Full for, for the story on Lou Elizondo, listeners should listen to the discussion we have with Leslie Kane and everything with me. Uh, so Lou Elizondo was part of a secret program studying this sorts of stuff. Yeah, he was, came out in 2017. He's kind of like he's my equivalent in the Navy. He quit the CIA yeah. out of protest, like I did, because no one would take an interest or believe him that UAP was real. And, you know, he has his own story and stuff, and God bless him. Well, maybe one yeah. day we'll have him on, too. Yeah. Uh, it's not I, impossible. Yeah, it's not impossible. Nothing's impossible. Right. As we've now come to learn, and uh, as we've come to learn also by uh, Dr. Jack Sarfati's theories. Uh, uh, Kevin, uh, uh, thank you for coming on. Thank you for being so open and sharing and not being... My uh, pleasure, man. And when you have me back, I hope you will. Yeah, I'd very much like to talk about the geology part of this. Yes, uh, let's let's do if that. If I could just cut to the quick on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I want to go into detail about it. But I published my research. Um, time went by. Elon Musk and uh, MZ out of Japan. They announced they're going to do a SpaceX flight around the moon and come home, mm -hmm. and they're going to take eight civilians. Go ahead and apply. So I, shit, they probably heard about me. So. I, I applied, and part of the application was you had to explain why you want to go. So I sent them my research. 
with a side note. I said, oh, hey, sir, um, by the way, this deposit, which, oh, by the way, is called the Josephine Ophiolite, and it's geology from the Pacific spreading arcs, and it's mineral deposits laid down by hydrothermal vents. And it took 157 million years to get here, and it's billions of years old, right? And it goes down belief, below my feet here, eight to 10 kilometers as far as we know, and it goes inland. Mm -hmm. And you can't mine it, or at least you couldn't before, because you're going to tear up the environment and cities and towns and roads above it, right? But I said, hey, uh, sir, this might be mineable now if you take your existing boring technology, he's putting in the tunnels between LA and Vegas, and repurpose it. You can mine these deposits straight down the layer of the mineral exactly and get these minerals out of the ground without destroying anything. And four days later, I was out right here in the yard and I look up in the sky right here. And, you know, aircraft are my game. And I saw this big, huge white airplane going right, jet aircraft, real low too, right over the top of the wilderness. And brother, you're not supposed to do that. Illegal. Uh -huh. The Cal is wilderness. And then I went east, west, east, west, north, south, north, south, east, west, all over the sky. And I run in the house, jump on the internet. And you know what it was? It was a NASA flight on a geodetic mission. Uh, four days after you submitted this. It, and they did a bunch of circles right around my mining claim. Wow. Right over the top of it. And you know what the beautiful thing would happen? It, it was from that. And again, I'm speculating, but I've, I've, um, my comfort, my suspicions have been a little bit confirmed on this, by the way. They did, they have announced recently, they just discovered hydrothermal vents off the coast of Seattle. They didn't know they were there. You know how they were discovered on that flight? On that flight. On that flight. Either on that flight or the subsequent ones that have been happening. They they had another one just yesterday. Yeah, checking out your geological. Because the, ge the geology here has been acting up, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, the beautiful part about it is, is they, now they know and are aware of a tsunami threat that it had no idea was there. Turns out Chief Seattle was right. That's why the Native Americans didn't build in Seattle. Because they knew that every once in a while, a tsunami comes. Oh. Yeah. So, long story short, my time in the wilderness and the, everything that happened may have resulted in a lot of life being saved. If you're, that ain't beautiful. You're, you're repaying. Please tell dude. me what it is. That you're repaying. That is beautiful. That is beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> We're, we're bookending this conversation um, quite poetically. Uh, Kevin, thank you for uh, for uh, showing, not being afraid to showing us uh, your emotion um, and your dedication to be of service. Very, very, very cool. Uh, let, let's have another conversation. Tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Mr. Up service. Uh, it, it, actually, here. Let, 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 let's, one more question. One more question before we go. Because uh, we ask this of most others. Not, uh, not always, but mostly. Um, and then we'll close off. What, what is greatness to you? Volunteering. Period. That's probably the best one word answer I've heard so far. <laughs> Dude, let's leave it at that. That's amazing. Thank you. Welcome. My honor. Hey, it's Enrico Colantoni here, actor, director, and dedicated napper. Like what you heard today? There's more to come. Make sure to subscribe to Behind Greatness and learn about our live events at inspirenorth.com. You'll also find links to our social media right on our website, so be sure to give us a like and follow. Until next time, stay inspired.